I'm also joined by John Cheney Leopold, who is a professor of American culture and digital studies at the University of Michigan. John is the author of We Are Data, and his work focuses on the atheistic middle class white, white masculinity shaping Silicon Valley. Kate Crawford is a distinguished research professor at NYU and also the co-founder of the AI Now Institute and a principal researcher at MSR. For the last decade, she has studied the political and social implications of large-scale data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Ingrid Burrington is an artist, illustrator, writer, and the author of Networks of New York, an illustrated field guide to urban internet infrastructure. Navneet Alang is a freelance technology and culture writer based in Toronto. He holds a PhD in English from New York, from York University, excuse me, and his dissertation was about digitality and a desire for post-positionality identity. So I'd like to open our panel today by having um, Kate explain a little bit about the terms we'll be using and the distinctions, however nuanced they might be, between AI, big data, automation, machine learning, what do those words mean? Are there meaningful differences between them? And if so, what are they? Well, thank you, Aisha. I'm going to start by just saying a giant thank you for inviting us to be here, um, everyone from the committee, but also what a pleasure it is to be on a panel with friends and colleagues and people whose work I've known for a long time. So hi, everyone. It's great to be here. This is the um, what I call the shitty question, which is where we get to talk about the definitions of these terms, which become a bit of an alphabet soup when you have AI, ML, etc. Um, and there's two ways we can talk about uh, the way that these terms are used and operationalized. Um, one is, I think, through looking at their histories, and the other is sort of looking at the sort of the marketing practices that uh, subtend them. The way that I tend to think about um, artificial intelligence, which is the oldest of the three terms that you asked about, uh, is that we can go back to 1956 to the Dartmouth Conference, where a group of men decided that they could solve human intelligence in a summer, um, and it didn't quite work out that way. Um, but what we've seen now, effectively, is that this, this term, I think, operates in sort of three core ways. It's uh, essentially referring to a subset of technical approaches. Right now, the, the technical approach that's in its absolute heyday is machine learning. Uh, machine learning really came to the fore um, in the, around the last 12 years, but particularly in the last eight, where we saw the emergence of convolutional neural nets and the combination of facial recognition technologies and very, very large scale amounts of data being extracted primarily by a small handful of tech companies. So we've got these technical practices, but on top of that, these terms also refer to social practices. So ultimately, the people who are in these rooms and in these industries get to decide what artificial intelligence will be, what its problem domains will be, what sorts of issues should be addressed. And that's why also when we start to think about these questions, we have to think about who are the humans actually creating these technologies. And then finally, uh, certainly in the case of artificial intelligence, it's also an industry. And it's an industry which has extremely concentrated power, primarily in the hands of around seven companies uh, worldwide. but. Um, depends you know, how you count. Um, but certainly thinking about the industrial dynamics of these tools is actually really important as well, because you have companies that have an enormous amount of power really changing the terms at will. So you see a kind of uh, sort of cloud around, you know, literally and figuratively, around how these terms are operationalized. And I think I've loved the way that Ingrid has talked about um, the way that you can really tell if something is AI. Oh, do you want me to yeah. tell them? Oh, I just said this before that, well, because. I should ask sort of like, what is the main difference between like AI or like automation or any other kind of like technical application? I was like, it's really the number of zeros you put on the contract. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, realistically, I think uh, another way we could sort of think about this is almost sort of archaeologically that sort of, you know, big data is this term just for talking about the substrate, which is this kind of, you know, how we recognize data and where it's extracted from. Machine learning is the next layer up in terms of how it's sort of being used, interpreted, and used to create sort of a predictive layer. And then artificial intelligence is kind of this other kind of dynamic where you could say, well, how is this being applied to particular problem domains through social spaces? So I hope that's okay for Absolutely. you. It's the shortest, the shortest possible description I can give you. We could, of course, do a whole panel just on how those definitions are Used. No, absolutely. Thank you. I think that's very helpful. And increasingly, you know, you mentioned these are businesses and they're concentrated largely in Silicon Valley. And um, John, I'd love for you to sort of explain 
for us, the culture of Silicon Valley and the dominant ideology that's responsible for much of how this technology is conceptualized and um, sold and promoted. Yeah, well, that's, thank you. Um, I, I, I was been, I've been thinking about this question a lot, and it's because, you know, you know people in the valley, or you kind of get used to the vocabularies that a lot of people used to talk about things. And for me, one of the best ways to interpret this question is sociologist Adam Tufakci's um, notion that she says Silicon Valley is the weirdest thing because it's a business about the social made by engineers. And so when you have that differentiation, you get responses to really important social and political problems, asymmetries that are just 100%, you know, everywhere in society, you get an engineering solution, an engineering logic. And so this larger engineering logic for me is very compelling. And there's a quick example we can give. In 2009, Doug Bowman was the lead designer for Google. It's a very famous story in these, in the worlds of, of, of I guess, artificial intelligence or, or just of data data-centered um, analysis, and he's an artist. And he said, I want to have a blue for the O of Google. And the Google brass were like, actually, no. What we can do is just, because we have billions of people looking at the site every you know, day, what you can do is you can just have A-B testing and see how many times or how many milliseconds more people are on a certain page based on that. The idea being that you remove subjectivity, you remove anything that's specific or culturally or epistemically local to the thing that's happening in order to just make a compelling insight-based argument for what should be done. And obviously, you have no reason why a certain color is to just perform better based on the metrics. But part of this engineering logic or part of that ideology is that really easy ability to abstract everything in order to make it computable. And so we see this all the time. There's very famous videos that are extraordinarily prolific in showing the racism that is implicit in a lot of facial recognition algorithms. And the idea being that it's a, gen like a general just sense of data that they don't necessarily think about. They think, OK, we just trained it enough, and it's going to come out. And so that notion that the, resol the resolution to these problems are not let's actually reconfigure these ontological bases by which humanity is developed or by which even history is based. It's like, let's put more data, let's fine tune the algorithms, or even let's think about, we don't need to be right all the time. We need to be right 92% of the time. That's the marketing strategy, you know, 92% of the time is more or less good. Um, but what's happening, you know, the NSA has a 51% confidence measure if you're a citizen of the US or not. These ideas are, we're actually, re -cha we're challenging what is epistemically true because it's no longer true or false. It's based on this percentage confidence issue that for me is very compelling to think through in terms of how knowledge works, but then it gets back to the ideology, which is that it's never you can get outside the circuit. It's constantly about the data that it is, and then the algorithms of how they're programmed. So based on you know what you just described, like Silicon Valley has a very unique, uh, historically unique relationship to data and information, which were you know up until now um, used to just be words for truth, but that no longer seems to be the case. And you know we've often seen how the technology emerging out of Silicon Valley essentially remaps patterns of racism and sexism um, and reproduces those patterns because the source data contains them, then you know, my next question is, is the false neutrality of um, artificial intelligence a feature or a bug? Is this, is this on? Can, can people hear me? Um, I think that like, the question of whether or not it's a feature or a bug depends on, on who you ask. Uh, because I think that there's uh, a sense in the valley that it's very much a bug. I think, as John was saying, that you just need to tweak the algorithm or you just need to add in more data. And I think that it kind of stems from this weirdly, like almost like transcendentalist uh, ideology that, that exists in the valley that is almost like this extension of the general sort of liberal humanist enlightenment project uh, in which you know, like the, the, the general kind of, I don't know, conservative approach of we, we, we have access to objective truth. Um, you know, the, there, are, there are hierarchies of, uh, uh, of worth and of, and of value, and, and it just so happens that those, those values happen to be, you know, white, male, Eurocentric, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that ideology that you can somehow escape uh, the limits of bias or subjectivity um, really permeates the valley. And so I think that the idea of the, that we can be neutral is very much an attempt to escape um, uh, uh, subjectivity and by extension politics. Um, but the weird kind of paradox of, of, of that approach is that in the very attempt to produce the neutral, you end up reproducing bias, right? That is the thing that, that reproduces bias. And so I think that what ends up happening is that in treating bias like a bug, you produce it as a feature. Absolutely, and I think um, that desire to escape that you just mentioned, I think it 
is part of what inspired like the name of today's panel is God view and this sort of desire to opt out out of so much of um, you know human relationships and politics that in practice isn't possible and is creating a new a new politics ruled by these technocratic libertarians and you know Kate I'd love for you to get into how a lot of this emergent technology um, dodges accountability and either you know displaces it or removes it entirely yeah I've been thinking a lot about how um, in the criminal justice context specifically, right? Folks are probably aware that um, courts across the country as well as police departments are now using both predictive policing tools on the law enforcement side and then in the courts, um, these what they call risk assessment instruments that determine uh, whether or not to hold someone pre-trial in the bail context, also maybe even the length of someone's sentence and then also what parole will be granted and what the conditions will be for parole. This is a really interesting case study in my view of the way in which these technologies are used as a means of avoiding systemic change and avoiding politics writ large because there's a nationwide movement in this country to abolish cash bail. There's a traveling lawsuit going around the country finding a poor person who's been jailed because they can't afford to pay bail and filing constitutional litigation at the state level to try to say that that's unconstitutional. Such a case came to Massachusetts and the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts held that in fact the Massachusetts bail statute itself does not allow for the courts to jail someone because they're poor. So the legislature's response to this was not to say, hmm, maybe we ought to not incarcerate people pre-trial just as a matter of course. That should maybe be the default, which is frankly what advocates are pushing for nationwide. Advocates are saying no cash bail, presumptive release. Um, this also has a really important impact on whether or not someone will be convicted. Um, folks who are allowed to go home and then show up to court for their hearing are much more likely to, to see those uh, charges dismissed than people who come to court in chains from jail. So it really has a huge impact on people's freedom. Instead of adopting the more liberationist posture that would say, okay, you know, we shouldn't keep people in jail, in jail because they're poor, we ought to just move towards a presumptive release model. The Massachusetts State Legislature tried to adopt a mandatory risk assessment instrument which is sort of just a way of using technology to get around the fact that people in our country have pretty much decided it's not acceptable to jail poor people simply because they can't pay. So we were able to stop that in Massachusetts, but I think that's a really important example of a way in which these types of systems are being used in our criminal justice system, certainly in the predictive policing context, that's another example of this. You know, we don't actually look at why you know, people are engaged in crimes. We're not really interested in pursuing a public health model with respect to drug use and addiction. We sort of continue doing the same things that we've been doing for a long time with drug policy. But now we have computers that will help police know which areas of a city to, to focus on or which even individual people should be subject to heightened scrutiny by the police in places like Chicago where there's a predictive policing program that actually targets individuals, not just geographic locations. There's another really interesting example of this, though, which is sort of the opposite. Um, in Boston recently, some MIT researchers worked with the Boston Public Schools to try to actually create an anti-racist algorithm. There's a real problem all across the country that I didn't know about until I got involved in some of this work which is basically about bell times in public schools um, and busing systems and you know the decisions that are made about which public school starts at what time in the day and gets out at a different time. And these decisions actually have huge consequences for students' performance and there are real racial equity um, problems, frankly, in bell times in Boston specifically. If you're a young black person in the Boston public schools, it is much more likely that you have to get up really early in the morning to go to school and that you get out at like 1 p.m. And for the schools that have a higher opportunity index, AKA mostly white schools, they have later start times and get out later in the day, which correlates to better performance in a lot of ways. So 
these MIT researchers working with the Boston Public Schools designed an anti-racist algorithm that would actually address this problem and use you know, machine learning techniques basically to produce a fair, a fair system that both saved the city a lot of money and tried to deal with this racial equity problem. And what happened was fascinating because when the results of the new bell times were released, those white parents who had for so long been benefiting from this system of racial inequity were absolutely fucking livid. And th those were the people who have the time and political power to crowd school committee meetings. And so it was like almost the opposite case in which the algorithm tried to avoid politics and failed because of politics, because of the entrenched political system in, in Boston, in Massachusetts. Um, so yeah, I'm just interested in the way that, you know, algorithms are basically avoiding very difficult, political, messy, human interactions. Absolutely, and it also proves sort of the banality, like AI and these subjects are no longer, um, you know, this abstract looming specter. They're being widely adopted. And as a result, I think it's really important to grapple with what's in the public imagination already regarding these technologies and how that influences um, you know, policy. I think in the example you mentioned, one of the signs I thought was so fascinating that a white parent held up was families over algorithms, which on its surface sounds like something that we would all want to get behind, but within that very particular political context has very different implications. And I think, you know, Ingrid, I'd love for you to tell us more about how sort of the, you know, history really of people, like stereotypes people hold about these technologies and kind of how they're influencing um, how we talk about them today and and whether, what that interaction is like, whether there's any truth to it. Yeah, I mean, first of all, like um, algorithms over families all the way. Um, <laughs> families is worse. But uh, I do love, like I can't get it. That's such a great, know, so. um, yeah, I mean the the like, popular culture manifestations of artificial intelligence are not usually like, maybe this is also just because like political economy doesn't really great make for like a great action movie sort of scenario. Um, <laughs> but like there is a tendency like to, to frame kind of like, like a lot, like I think, yeah, the, the common kind of like trope of like the sentient robot and it's gonna do a bad thing kind of never really acknowledges like, all of the human beings required to make the sentient robot and all of the human labor that kind of like underpins its ability to exist. Like there's like one scene in T3 that kind of gets at that, but like we don't have time to talk about, I, I don't, I'm embarrassed to admit that I knew that I shouldn't have said that on the stage. <laughs> um, it involves a modem sound anyway. Um, but yeah, I think like, yeah, there's, there's a, generally like the frame, like a lot of this, like a lot of the stuff that is sort of generally framed as, you know, that's far off or like, more like, like uh, this is going in and out. It's meh. Um, thank you. Uh, yeah, a lot of the, a lot of the things that are kind of maybe in a like cinematic or narrative context seen as this like looming threat are like already around, and they're mostly made of people. Um, that's just never, but like I guess that's not as like. That's not as interesting of a villain. Like that kind of complicity is like not really as like fascinating as like a robot skeleton crushing your skull. But they're invisible. I mean, that's the thing. The people are often invisible, right? Like, right. like the person who's being sentenced or told, no, you're not going to be able to go home to await trial because this risk assessment tool says that you're likely to fail to appear to court or you're dangerous. They don't know who designed that algorithm. And in fact, it's a proprietary trade secret what the algorithm actually is doing. Um, there was a court case in Wisconsin where this guy, Eric Loomis, was arrested, faced, you know, was convicted of a crime, and then uh, was sentenced in part based on one of these risk assessment tools that said, you know, give, give the guy seven years. And the judge said, okay, sure, seven years. And he appealed that and tried to fight back and say, I want access to the code and to know about this system that you know, sentenced me effectively. And the Wisconsin Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that. And here's the really interesting part. The decision sort of hinged on the fact that the algorithm was not actually making the decision. It was merely informing the judge's decision. So it's this really dangerous thing where, you know, the algorithm has a lot of power, but 
the, you know, the power as far as the system sees it is vested solely in, in the hands of the judge. So like nobody really has, is taking responsibility for that sentencing. Um, and he appealed it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no thanks. So that's the state of the law now in Wisconsin. And what's amazing is that he actually found out. The vast majority of people have no idea that being assessed by systems, even within so-called uh, you know, sort of public service contexts. And this is one of the things that I find incredibly problematic, that these systems are generally being marketed and sold into a whole range of sectors, education, health, criminal justice, et cetera. And there's really no mechanism by which you can even be informed of the fact that these tools are now being brought to bear, either in an assistive decision context or purely actually making a decision based on whether or not your CV means you will be you know, in the pool of potential applicants or whether or not you're going to get a scholarship to go to university. All of these things are happening completely, as you say, sort of below the waterline. And one of the things we've been working on at AI now is looking at this idea of like an algorithmic impact assessment. Like how do you help public servants in these situations where they're like having huge amounts of marketing pressure to sort of buy a system and implement it? It's like, well, how do you give them tools to say, wait, all right, how do we assess how this system is going to impact not just one population, but really diverse populations? And one of the things that I think is the more radical step that can be made here, rather than just how do we ass you know, assess a system to make sure it's fair, is actually how do you change the numbers of communities who get to have a say about how a system is being constituted? And I think this is the moment to really do that. And I think it's incredibly concerning to me that we're seeing the rise of this fairness discourse, which initially was a critique of these systems that we're starting to see like lapses in fairness now suddenly be abrogated back into engineering discourse, that we can effectively fix these problems by making systems more fair. But what you'll notice the more that you sort of spend time reading those papers and looking at the system design is that fairness is being understood as parity. And that's exactly what happened in Boston. It's like, well, as long as we make sure that everyone's getting the same bell times, then it's fair. Well, actually, no, we have to talk about justice. We have to talk about structural structural inequality in that city, which is extreme. And then you have to say, this is a political problem first before it's a technical problem. That makes me think of a comment you made, which is the idea of the liberal political subject is the thing that we've used to think through in terms of what is politics for you know, centuries. And it's still told to us. But I think what we're seeing right now is one, we can't see these algorithms. Two, often they don't appear to us as individual discrete. You often we're you know, put into a category or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, Three, that these discourses are proprietary, which means that it's, there's a multiplicity of them. And so a lot of my work, I think about how machine learning tries to figure out what gender is. But this is not a gender for politics. It's not a gender for patriarchy. It's not a gender for white supremacy. It's not a, a race for white supremacy or, or whatever. These are marketing things that are trying just to do predictive possibilities, to find out what's going to happen next. And so with this, usually we say, oh, I have politics. I'm going to go to this place. I'm going to engage with, but actually you don't go in. You don't know what it is. It's changing all the time, and there's no real teeth that any liberal political project has because of that, but also because big data requires big challenges, and it requires us to reframe, and this is something we were talking about before, what is neutral? Neutrality doesn't have to just be parity. It doesn't have to be like net neutrality is described in terms of it's politically useful, but it could be we could think of a, a non-neutral network that privileges people who need bandwidth more than the rich people. And that would be a very useful political thing that goes at the level of infrastructure, but it doesn't try to say, OK, well, only if individuals got together. It has to be collective. And I think that's a really useful pivot that we can make to think about what politics is. I was just going to say that um, transparency is key. And the work that you all have done at AI Now on that question is really important. I'm struggling with um, figuring out mechanisms by which communities can actually say no just straight up no, right? Like in the criminal justice system, for example, I don't know that we're actually having the really serious conversation as a society that we need to be having, which is basically an answer to this question. Do we think under any circumstances, even if the technology were to be 100% accurate, which it will never be, but say for the sake of argument that it is, do we think it's acceptable for a computer program effectively to decide whether or not someone is incarcerated or arrested. I yeah. mean, we're and not I, having those conversations. We're talking about fairness and accuracy yeah. and transparency, which are important, obviously. But I think there's a threshold question that has to get asked way before we even get to those yeah. sort of characteristics of the systems, right? 
I'm with you. And actually, yeah. our first move is to call for a total moratorium yeah. on any system that is proprietary and cannot be investigated and audited in any public context. It is absolutely a total breach of basic due process that you cannot understand how something is working. So I think we absolutely, I think that this is, like, we're completely of one mind on this, that there are places where these systems simply should not be deployed. Another place that I think we should really make do a lot more political work is around political, basically predictive policing. Predictive policing has not been shown to do anything other than ingrain forms of racial and essentially class bias. And there, are, I mean, there are studies by you know radical organisations like RAND. <laughs> I mean, not exactly like people out there on the fringe showing that these systems are not actually working. So I mean, there is this moment where I think a much higher standard of proof has to be brought to bear before any of these systems should be touching public life. And that is a space where you know, we actually have a lot more rights than we do in, say, the straight up corporate sector. And that's why I think it's important to focus there. And I think that's why in talking to you all earlier before this panel, so many of my questions revolved around this dis constant displacement of accountability, because what that really is doing is it um, forecloses on the opportunity for the public to consent. And the complete absence of the, you know, opportunity to consent or dissent from this technology, I think, has um, pretty alarming, uh, you know, consequences. Um, one thing just uh, that I wanted to kind of bring this up, your point about um, just the question of should this be here at all, I think that the like weird like laundering of like fairness as like an instrument of industry is very much relevant. So like, like did people see if, uh, earlier this week, um, Axon formerly Taser announcing that they had like an AI ethics board for their like body camera products? Like, I mean, like Taser loves cops. They have always loved, they literally like made a tool to help cops like electrocute people. The idea that like, oh, well now they have an ethics board and it's going to be like fine. Like the accountability as sought through like an internal kind of like, I, in some ways I think like, like maybe part of the challenge is like not directing the call to accountability solely to like companies do better, be better. Cause like they will certainly, they're more than happy to self-regulate um, because that means that they continue to have like the product deployments like on their terms. Um, I was I was just going to say that um, another aspect um, uh, that that this affects, or another sector that this affects, and this is definitely not something that I learned watching The Good Wife. I, I swear, um, is that uh, organ donations are also uh, uh, sometimes run by by algorithms, and it to me uh, uh, kind of raises the question then of of regulation or, or where legal structures come in. And, and I, I'm the only Canadian on the panel, so that's you know. I'm going to have a slightly more pro-statist uh, approach, I suppose, um, but but it is that sort of question of of uh, what kind of like legal framework is possible to 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 foreclose or, or preempt some of those the applications of of these systems, right? Just to speak directly to that question, I mean, I, I always think of it this way. The only real problem that we have as a human species is climate collapse in the sense that we can't stop it at this point. All of the stuff that we're talking about up here are things that we actually really do have control over. It's really a political question, right? Our political system is fundamentally broken in this country, at least. Um, there are, though, I think, ways at the local and the state level to actually make some meaningful interventions. So one thing that the ACLU is doing nationwide is to try to pass local ordinances that require law enforcement to get affirmative city council approval before buying any new surveillance technology. So that would include facial recognition, you know, predictive policing systems like that. Um, these future-proof laws that are not about one type of technology, right, but they're about all types of these technologies um, that require a process. Not, you know, they're not prescriptive in the sense that they say yes to facial recognition and no to drones. They merely mandate that these decisions cannot be made administratively, which is what they've been, what the government has been doing for, you know, forever. Um, and most people, frankly, don't go to city council meetings, are not, you know, looking on the police website to see, to try to find scraps of information about, you know, what they've been purchasing and how long they've been using it and things. These conversations need to be surfaced and the public, 
through our you know local and state representatives need to have a much more active role in making these decisions not police chiefs who are like you said Kate um, getting these glossy brochures from companies and receiving hundreds of millions of dollars from the federal government through to the, the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice, and basically just like, wow, we can buy all these toys. That is literally how this is unfolding all across this country right now. And so there really are, um, to your point about law, there really are some things that we can do immediately. Certainly the larger questions about what to do about Silicon Valley um, and regulating things at a federal level with respect to consumer data and you know decision making about much more complicated things that are not so easily um, you know figure outable uh, as as things like predictive policing and facial recognition, which I think frankly we should just say no to. Um, those are much thornier issues. Yeah, and like, like let's talk about regulation for a second because. We have an extraordinary moment. You might have noticed that your inboxes right now are being stormed by Pinterest has just changed its privacy policy. Snapchat has just changed its privacy policy. Guess what? It's because of regulation. It's GDPR in Europe, which just comes into effect in, ooh, one and a half weeks. Um, and it's extraordinary to see that this, this sort of major shift towards data protection in Europe is having an enormous flow on impact into Silicon Valley, into its own practices. And we've seen Facebook say that it's not going to afford those same protections to US citizens that it is going to give to Europeans. So we have this moment where you can see that regulation has impacts. And even if you have a sector of the world saying, OK, we're going to change practices here, that flows on into all of those Silicon Valley engineering practices. You have to shard servers differently. You have to decide who's being served what. You have to have different warnings for different people. You have to send billions of emails. Um, these are actually signs that regulation, as much as I think in the US, it's often seen as sort of a, a dead duck. And certainly under the current administration, it definitely is at a federal level. I think it can do a lot. And certainly at the local level here, we've seen you know the effort by de Blasio around algorithmic accountability start to get some steam. We now have a bill here in, in New York, which is the first in the US. Um, and we're starting to see more movement from other countries. And again, now France is really starting to think very actively about the types of regulations that they would have purely there for French citizens. So we have a, a, an interesting moment, I think, to talk about regulation and what it could do. Um, what concerned me, though, was I'm sure, I mean, who here was watching the sort of the Zuckerberg moments in Congress? Did we all watch? Yeah, it was some, some great TV, right? Um, just, just seeing that as kind of that as the US regulatory landscape was terrifying to me because the level of debate was like, oh, well, I'm on Facebook. Yeah, great work that you built that. That's a great job you did there. I'm like, wow, this is, <laughs> this is a problem if this is how we're going to be talking about regulation. Well, it also affirmed Silicon Valley sort of operational sense of being exempt from politics and the theatrics of regulation, which is what that hearing amounted to, was, I think, more so bolstering to Silicon Valley in terms of what it can get away with. I mean, didn't didn't Facebook stock go up the day of those hearings? Yep. Like that's yeah. I think that that kind of because I mean the the thing that's been interesting the, the last you know month or so of people being mad again at Facebook is like unlike every other time we've been mad at Facebook, like they actually lost money on it. Like their stock went down in like a significant way, not in sort of like a trivial moment. And that could be attributed to other things going on in the market. But ultimately, like that seemed to facilitate like a lot of swift movement. And it's like the second that Zuckerberg like puts on a fucking tie and like shows up and like explains like, you know, why like your grandson hasn't friended you back or whatever. Like he it's like, oh, all right. They're playing by the rules. Like we're going into like the like like they're doing the right things. Like and like this is like going back to the smooth operation before. Like I think one of the most frustrating things to me about the last I didn't even I'm not even going to say the name of the scandal because we all know it and I hate I hate their name so much. Um, is that it sort of suggests this like if only we can go back to the like good version of neoliberal surveillance, not when like the bad people use it to maybe elect a fascist. Like there's a better way to do it when we just let like the CIA elect fascists in other places or some shit. And absolutely, and I think what's interesting, is, especially in America, is so much of this debate is happening on the terrain of the logic of market capitalism and neoliberalism and a lot of it, what should be considered as um, issues of public policy is being treated as consumer choices. And there's an assumption that these are 
um, you know, it factors that people can opt in and opt out of. I mean, even the phrase opt in and opt out is one of like the rote responses of these tech platforms and companies. And I, I wonder if how much of that is just due to a cultural difference between the way things are in America versus in Europe, which encourages more regulation or, you know, a function of the demographics of our Congress and what the, I think we can all understand the urgency and necessity of change, but what would that, um, you know, how do we get there? Like, what does this moment really demand of us since we are, as consumers, being disproportionately tasked with responding to it? Um, I'll respond really quickly. I'm not going to be able to say the latter part, but um, I was compelled to think of an example of an algorithm that came out a couple of weeks ago. It's a joint between AT&T researchers and a researcher from a university in Israel, and they found out, they're like, what if we were able to do something very banal? Like, what if we were going to be able to figure out which photos and where you are and if you're happy in them or sad, and then when you are thinking about going on vacation, we'll have this huge cache of emotional GPS data, and then through semantic analyses as well as facial analyses, you'll be able to say, you are happiest in Rome, so you should go to Rome again. <laughs> and it's weird, but there's this, there's, that's, it's sold, and it's very marketable, fun, profit, like, you know, oh, that's nice. And if you're at and if you own the network, as you can right now because of the regulations being reduced, um, you can do all the surveillance and have extraordinary data cache to then make assessments. But the interesting thing that crosses into the state is if you think of, well, okay, what if you have certain groups of people and you could figure out if they're angry? And what if those people who are angry maybe are going to get political? And what happens if you can prevent the incipient nation, you know, civil war that might happen by saying, well, let's just completely repress this one neighborhood with police violence? Um, and for me, that's the way that a lot of these marketing companies are able to use the same algorithms, obviously the exact same more or less kind of setups, to do similar things from, you know, emotional recognition in terms of where you want to go to vacation to eventually, you know, large state, pre state repression. Um, it's a really easy thing, and also there's no real regulation that can stop that short of these really important things we're talking about. Yeah, and I think if you want to find the intermediate place between you know, how this is being marketed as a fun holiday tool versus to how it's being used to sort of repress political change is you could just look at the workplace because, of course, that's where we're starting to see uh, enormous amounts of manipulation of emotional data, including a company right now that basically takes a snapshot of your face every 10 minutes to see if you're looking productive and if you're looking engaged with your work right through to HireVue, which is being used by everyone from Goldman Sachs through to Walgreens, which means that every time you do an interview, they're videoing your face and then mapping 250,000 data points to decide, are you smiling in the right places? Or are you, you know, saying the right things in the way that our top performers do? And they match your facial movements to their top performers. So you can just imagine how that produces these unbelievably sort of rigid uh, companies that are really just hiring people who look like everybody else. And, and I think at the workplace level is where you're really starting to see these um, be operationalized in particular ways. And, and certainly from a sort of a more theoretical perspective, um, we could have a fascinating discussion about what are the assumptions around sentiment and emotion that underlie these algorithms. Because the more I go back into the history of these systems, which I've been doing a lot of lately, it's unbelievably disturbing. It's this whole, it maps to these sort of, again, 1960s models of psychology, that there are seven emotions and that you're having one of these at this time, which will either make you a happy and productive worker or a, a possibly a troubled worker that we need to put through a HR process. So, I mean, again, even just starting to, to question these sort of fundamental assumptions around the human and affect and sentiment, I think is really important theoretical work that needs to be done. And I wonder if that hegemonizes certain cultural ticks or completely enshrines what's already, you know, the dominant status quo. For example, I mean, in, in what you've just described, um, it's really interesting how much of what's new out of Silicon Valley is very much old in terms of how amenable it is to like regressive ideas of evolutionary psychology and cultural differences. And I, I can just imagine people using that technology and talking about how, well, the Chinese are very stoic and they are, you know, inscrutable and that's why they make this kind of worker and, and really actively discriminating against those kinds of differences here. But those are technologies that are already employed by workplaces and evaluating their employees. Yeah, I was going to say that, I mean, there's a, a kind of neo-colonial threat to this because I mean, there's this weird sort of ideological tension where, 
if you listen to the way that Google and Facebook talk about their their overarching project, it's it's sort of weirdly like supranational in a way or, or, or global in a way that effaces local difference. Um, and it's a sort of really sort of dystopian vision of, of, of superseding the nation state with these Silicon Valley companies that then not only does it uh, push a particular kind of economic structure around the world or, or an economic infrastructure around the world, it also then becomes uh, a vector to, to sort of foster that um, you know, neo-colonial project of, of, of spreading, quote unquote, Western democracy you know, uh, around the world or, or really free market capitalism. So your question about change, like how do we change things? Um, John, when you mentioned the vacation tool that at and is building, I saw something similar that was um, some company that sells photographs to people who run marathons. So they're like doing facial recognition on an entire race, um, you know, a road race. And then if you sign up for this service, you give them a photograph of your face and they will pull out every time the cameras caught you while you were running and you can pay like a dollar for a photo or something like that. Um, facial recognition is sold to the public by the private sector as a convenience. Um, there's a, another example of this. JetBlue has entered into an agreement with uh, the U.S. government, with the TSA, and they're in some airports, including at Logan, on certain flights, um, allowing allowing you to use your face instead of a boarding pass. Um, and I was interviewed by local media about this specific project a bunch, and reporters were telling me, like, you know, I just went to Logan and interviewed people who were in the line to be subjected to this, and you could opt out if you wanted to, but nobody did. Everybody, you know, went through the facial recognition thing, in part, some people, because they thought it was cool, right? Because there's this tendency, I think, among a lot of Americans, or maybe just human beings generally, to think that any new thing is cool. Um, but I... I'm really concerned about the normalization of something like facial recognition, for example. Um, I think that one difficulty that we are going to face in terms of addressing even something that is as, in my view, black and white as a, as a political problem as facial recognition is this, you know, the fact that the corporate sector, the private sector stands to make a lot of money off of technology like this. And that people in the United States, despite the fact that I think Americans think of ourselves as people who love freedom, actually really love control <laughs> and, and don't mind many Americans being controlled by corporations like Google and Facebook in exchange for whatever you know, services or information or connection they provide or by the government in exchange for the promise of security, um, the promise of you know, expediency at the airport or whatever. So I actually think that a really critical political project is resistance to those systems. And that can take the form even of simply saying at the airport, absolutely fucking not. Do, do not take my picture. I will hand you my boarding pass. Thank you very much. Well, it's interesting because then it'll become yet another thing that the rich are exempt from. Because if the normalization of facial recognition reaches you know, its ultimate saturation, then the only people that could, you know, practically get away from it are those that can afford to alter their face. And I think those kinds of patterns are really interesting to be alerted to early because they just illuminate a lot about where things are headed. And I think it's part of I mean, what you've all just described, another ways in which um, American corporations are kind of operating outside of the bounds of like governance. And as a result, um, shaping the world order around the world and sorry i just have to say that i know i've been talking a lot but a colleague of mine yesterday referenced something that somebody who works for a company that builds fac facial recognition tools said on a panel yesterday morning and apparently this guy said it's going to be great because like at the airport for example you won't ever have to stop you can just walk into the airport and your face will be your ticket so nobody will ever ask you any questions. You know, you'll be on pre-check, so your bag doesn't have to get searched. You just walk right through the airport and you get on the plane. He was selling facial recognition to elite, privileged, mostly white people on the basis that it provides them, quote, invisibility, which is fascinating because, you know, 
these systems, like that's part of the political problem, right? Is that yes, Google collects all this information about us. Yes, Facebook does. Yes, they control what information we access. Yes, the police have, you know, Palantir systems and facial recognition and all this stuff and predictive policing. The reason there isn't a, you know, mass movement to challenge these things is that everyone is being watched and monitored and manipulated, but the impacts on individuals are so different depending on how much money you have, what color your skin is, what your education level is, where you live, right? So for powerful people, it may actually be that this guy is right, that facial recognition will be good for them. It will make like rich, powerful white people's lives easier. And for political dissidents, for black folks, for immigrants, for Muslims, it is going to be literal dystopia. I was just going to say, um, you said it already, but um, one of the most interesting things when I'm teaching, I teach at the University of Michigan, a lot of my students do the thing, well, I don't care about my privacy because I'm not doing anything. And it's the, the only answer to that is the people who don't care about privacy are the people who have never had a bad experience with the state in their life. Because if you have one or if you have several or especially if you're groups who are, you know, family members are engaging with the state more, that privacy becomes the most survival based, it's requisite. It's not this thing that's nice so I don't have to get ads or I'm not you know, persuaded in some way to vote for some party. It's like literally you know, being stopped by the cops, being killed, or maybe even yet yeah, putting into a system and then not being able to get out. So I just wanted to, to echo on that. That's right. Absolutely, and I think at this point, um, we'd like to open up for the remaining few minutes we have left for any questions that might be, that people might have. Uh, first of all, thank you. That was really wonderful um, to all of you. So um, on a very deep level, almost a, a sort of philosophical question, uh, especially for Kate Crawford, I know that you wrote an article in which you talked about a data worldview, um, a data-based epistemology. Um, and it seems like in order to foster the change that we would want to see in the public conversation, we would have to begin understanding what this data epistemology or data worldview really is in nature and principle. Um, it seems like, however, um, that this work, which is very important, could be misconstrued to be sort of anti-science in a moment where we also need to raise awareness about what, about how important um, science, you know, whatever that word means, really is. Um, so I guess I, I wonder if any of you could speak to the tension between um, data, uh, critiques of data, and how important it is to do that while also affirming that we're not trying to uh, bring back pseudoscience or mysticism per se, right? Oh, I love this question. Thank you. Um, I'm, I have to say I'm really worried by the fact that uh, now people who are um, doing, uh, I think, really important critical assessments of uh, the ideologies and epistemologies of data are being called anti-science. And I'm seeing it more and more, and I'm seeing it uh, as a particular type of critique that's coming either from the most conservative branches of computer science or from more political quadrants. And I would suggest that we have to really watch that particular threat vector, because what is most important in these critiques is not that they're anti-science, it's actually that they're saying we need more science in what's happening in these systems. And it's actually what you're certainly seeing um, in some forms of, uh, I mean, we could really sort of go into very sort of specific systems. Is it's the opposite of the scientific method. It's not that you're coming up with a hypothesis and they're sort of looking at how that's sort of playing out over a diverse set of populations. It's like, well, we've made a set of predictions and now we're just going to apply it and see what happens with a 92% confidence bound. You know, that that is not science, actually. Um, and it's a type of um, exertion of power from above that I think it really needs to be critiqued a lot more. And part of this, I mean, to answer your question really, is it can be approached from many, many different angles. I mean, I think there's a really important angle for political activism here, and that's why it's a pleasure to be sharing a stage with Cade here. But it's also a really important academic project. It's also a really important artistic project. It's also a really important project for teachers, is how do you give people languages to start to question the statistical and predictive analysis of humans and their potential 
potential life paths. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. It's that profound that these systems will be used to modulate everything from your access to opportunities to your ability to get out of jail. At that point, this is a political project, and we have to query that at every level that we can. So I, I would say <laughs> strongly resist the anti-science framing and actually get down to show me how what you're doing is actually in any way scientifically valid. Because I think if you really look into it, the more that we've been doing this um, right down to specific sort of algorithmic systems, I think you'll see a lot of uh, problematic claim making that isn't necessarily based on sort of any kind of rigor whatsoever. I would just add to that that the idea that STEM is like real science and social science is fake is bullshit. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Eileen. Um, uh, I was very interested to hear uh, uh, Kate bringing up um, sentiment, the, sort of the technique of sentiment analysis and how it's used, because my impression, <laughs> I am not an expert, is, a, is that it's a bogus field if you're going to, a technique, if you're going to apply it to any kind of nuanced understanding. It's only good for just like, yeah, it's bad, good, sort of, kind of, right? And um, so, uh, and also, I think you brought up, maybe other people brought up the question of these, kind of the Silicon Valley's idea of psychology, these kind of experiments that were run, that were like these fascist fucking experiments that were run uh, in, the, in the Bay Area with completely, now we know they were wrong, their conclusions were wrong, uh, you know, so this is, a lot, a lot of psychology has been overturned in the last few years, and that's this kind of popular idea of how people think and how things work. So, um, and I'll just mention that in um, this kind of little field of digital humanities and literary studies, they've been doing sentimental analysis kind of experiments. And it seems to me most of them fail utterly because they're actually doing, they're kind of doing very sophisticated stuff or they want to find out sophisticated stuff and it doesn't seem to work at all. Anyway, so I was just wondering if the panel thought that there was some opportunity to really kind of expose those, those two particular things, which I think are just so flawed and so weak, you know, to kind of bring that forth. I mean, I don't know if logic is helpful here. If logic is helpful here. I, I, I really like that, and I was really compelled by, by Kate's answer. Um, but, thank you. Um, I don't need to say the beginning part. Uh, and so, so for me, so it's part of the neocolonialist move is the idea that any epistemological local place can actually speak for other people. And this is, you know, 101 humanities world. It's 101 critical theory. It's also just 101 science. Like, we have to do experiments at different places. All right. So because of that, I always think about, you know, there's anthropologists who have tell us, like, you know, there's emotions that we've never, ever heard of. We don't have language for that. There's feelings that, you know, people have 15 minutes, 15 years after leaving the field of this one culturally specific emotional vocabulary and they feel it. And it's these, the magic and the kind of like the, the craziness of the human condition is one that can never, ever be digital, dig, ontologically understood through a digital lens, right? And so precisely because of this, my real query is not necessarily if they're right or wrong, but how are these new epistemes, which are proprietary often, or black blocks, how are they producing the new lived realities by which we have to engage with? Because I can smile as much as I can in front of a camera, but if that version of smiling, as Kate was saying, doesn't actually fit with that template, then I'm not smiling. And so for me, that, there's this really interesting arbitrary, like that's not an arbitrary necessarily of, you know, happy or not, it's an arbitrary of like, am I the author of my subjectivity or somebody else? And for me, that's a really dismal future that ex explicitly is happening when these uh, um, new epistemologies are being created. They're algorithmically through correlation and not at all science. Yeah, I mean, one, uh, like, oh, it always feels a little bit like cheap to like look at some of these, just, like not particular in sentiment analysis, but like look at, you know, what are clearly kind of ethically dubious things and be like, also the math is bad. Cause it's like, well, like, yeah, but like, it's also just a shitty idea. Like it doesn't really matter if the math is bad. Um, but there is something of kind of like, maybe rather than asking sort of like, does it work? Like, does it do what it's kind of asking? Like, who does it actually work for? Like who's, who's served by, who benefits from, who can like kind of take advantage of the thing? Because like the math is like, you know, I've been writing into this recently, did a story about some like really problematic, uh, new predictive policing research was showing it to like computer science people who are all like, yeah, this reads like a first year grad student wrote it. Like they didn't really know what they were doing, but it's like, but it doesn't matter because it's still like, it's a paper. 
and it's like written in LaTeX and it looks like important and serious. And like at the end of the day, it's whether it works or not isn't really important to the people writing it. This is like, I, I, this is a really big one and I'm really glad that you raised it because I think there's two points to, to really take here. One is this question that Ingrid just raised, is like, you know, does it really matter? Can, can we just say that basically any of these ideas can be circulated and deployed and redeployed in computer science as though they're useful or factual and therefore can be, can be used to mean anything? I'd like to think it does still matter, and we may not have that long for it to matter, but I think we certainly have a moment where certain types of uh, deployments of knowledge should be seen as absolutely shameful. And I'm thinking here, for example, of the Wang and Kaczynski paper, which is sort of you know, colloquially known as the AI Gaydar paper, um, where they scraped uh, an unnamed dating site, assumed to be OkCupid, um, and compared it to a bunch of Facebook data and said that they could predict with high levels of confidence whether somebody was straight or gay. And what they assumed from this um, was that, and they, they invoked actually, uh, again, another sort of um, uh, much earlier form of uh, evolutionary biology where they're saying that, oh, it's, it's, all, it's all coming from basically um, in utero chemicals that you're being exposed to that will decide whether or not you're straight or gay. Now, this theory has been debunked itself, um, but it's being re-invoked in these studies as somehow a legitimate form of knowledge. And I think we actually have to push back very, very strongly, both on the kinds of operationalizations of knowledge, but also on exactly what Ingrid is saying is like, is it even legitimate that you should be doing this? And of course, that paper said, oh, we're doing it to show how bad this is and that it can be done. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, if you're working in epidemiology and you're like, here's a virus, we're going to put it out there just to show you it could be done, that would not be acceptable. And I think we have a moment now to say that some of these forms of work are actually not acceptable. And sometimes it's going to be epistemological, sometimes it's going to be ethical, sometimes it's going to be legal. But frankly, I think we have to use all of the tools at our disposal because this is important. And we're starting to see these types of techniques built into the most sensitive social institutions. And once that's done, it's really hard to roll it back. So I, I would say t yes to all of the above. We don't write out any of the things as an avenue of, of resistance to these types of tools and, and research that I think are like deeply problematic. Thank you all very much for all of this. This was fantastic. So um, I wanted to kind of get back to the question of situated knowledges and epistemologies. Um, this question of uh, what is legitimate is a very important question. Uh, what should we not even be trying to do in the first place? Um, and thinking about the implications of potential projects, but also the question of a positive stance on that, like not the positive is like a positivist, but the positive is you know, something that we can actually say uh, as, a, as a goal for ourselves. Um, might something like situated knowledge or intersubjectivity as a way for, for building something out of which we can know the world, not objectivity, because objectivity is a myth. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Um, there will always be bias. It's always going to happen. Um, but something uh, of an intersubjective lived set of experiences that are interlocked together to get as many perspectives and as many situated knowledges as possible. Might that be beneficial to AI and machine learning going forward? Might there be some way to do that and to take those lived experiences, those situated knowledges, and put them into the systems that we're trying to build and get something better than we're doing so far? I mean, I want to kind of repeat for you all something that Ingrid said before we got on stage, which is that there's a real asymmetry in terms of you know the amount of resources access to computing power data that is required in order to perform these types of calculations um, so companies like you know the big seven including google microsoft and facebook that have access to capital huge data centers huge amounts of computing power and tons of information um, What's the, ace what's the asymmetrical warfare look like? I don't know. I mean, how can, how can we in this room do AI? Like, we can't. Okay, so step one, we, we, we buy a submarine cable. <laughs> step two, we build some data centers. Step three, we build some wind farms for the fucking data centers yeah. so that we don't have a bad carbon footprint. Like, yeah, basically at this point, if you want to play in the space, the amount of kind of like material infrastructure you need is like 
pretty massive. Um, something, Damien, we were talking about this at lunch. I feel set up. Uh, but <laughs> I, think, I think a lot about, and I don't know if I have a good, like if it is correct, um, but I think a lot about like the, what it means to kind of have like solidarity across the supply chain in these systems um, in the sense that like where, where do you start to think about like building like a better version? Do you start at like the layer of like mining rocks? Do you start at the layer of manufacturing? Like, and I think to be able to see those, to see that kind of like entire kind of soup to nuts, like environmental, social, political, like context as like intertwined and like something where like you can't kind of like, so, like you have to kind of holistically look at the whole thing is like that, that is kind of the situated knowledge's approach. It's the approach that says like, you know, my fucking Amazon Echo spying on me like is bad, but like I will not stand, like I will not feel assuaged until like I both feel better about this device and like the, you know, worker in the Amazon fulfillment center doesn't like, you know, have to go to like one of the ambulances we have outside because it's too hot to work inside for like extended periods of time. Like being able to see like the entirety of the system is, is like reading a fucking Donna Haraway essay. It's exhausting. Um, <laughs> but I wonder if... Oh, she's better than that. Can I mean... She's fun. I know, she's fun. I just had the experience of like assigning it to undergrads and like being like, I'm so sorry. I didn't... You're 20. You Don't can't. say a word against Donna. <laughs> I mean, look, St. Donna, blessed, you know, praise she may be, but praise it's... Me. But the point being like to operate at that frequency of like comprehension of like the entire system at once. Um, I don't know if... That's the thing any one person can manage themselves, but to like even think about like, to think about building something different, like it's like one kind of has to ask like how far down the stack do you really want to go? Can I say, I, it really worries me that when I start to hear these debates, what I hear is like, how do we build our own AI to beat the other AI? It's like, actually, maybe the political solution is not building more AI. Like, uh, it's a staggering idea. And, and, and what is interesting is that I feel like we get trapped by exactly the same ideology in Silicon Valley, which is that the progress of technology is inevitable, and all we can do is carve out either like the open source version or a few privacy tools or maybe, you know, data protection. And it's these tiny little buckets where we can try to say, oh, maybe here we can have some space. And it's never going to be enough. That is, you are never going to win with a strategy like that. And I think the other way you could think about this is you could completely flip that equation and say, what kind of world do you want to live in? And then how can these tools serve that vision instead of driving that vision? And this is something that, you know, that I've been sort of writing about with Trevor Paglin, who's here in the front row, and it's something that you know, a lot of us are thinking about is that we're approaching this from the, from the wrong perspective if we're immediately beginning with the technocratic question of what kind of technology is going to help us, rather than like, how do we want to live? And so I think that might be a really powerful way to start to think about that, and I think yes, to situated knowledges, but let's put that in a bigger political program. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add to that, that, that I think that, I mean, see, now, now I feel like I'm going to get myself into trouble, but I feel like, say, for example, in, in the healthcare sector, I feel like there may be something useful in being able to look at, say, the health data of 10 million people, if that leads to, you know, you know, uh, better solutions for, you know, cancer care or medication, the obvious problem is, I think that the the ideological uh, uh, sort of basis driving the way that we approach that now is that it's always exposing, you know, uh, privacy concerns or it's about a profit motive, and so that that notion of what kind of world we want to have, if we if we if we make that inversion, then. And I could I could be you know being naive here, but I would I would also like to think that if there are ways that 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 you could help people using these particular technological tools, then that might be a, become a more more viable way to approach them. Like it might be that that there are still useful ways that that we can use machine learning or, or artificial intelligence. Um, it's just that the ideology underlying them currently uh, tends to tends to do the opposite of that. All right, um, y'all actually just turned right into my question, so this is wonderful. Um, I, in listening to this whole panel, you're dancing around like regulation and and approaching how do we constrain or um, limit the the questions, 
And it made me think about machine learning is at the point already where we don't actually understand what's happening. We can put a bunch of data as input, and then we get an output, and we have no idea what happened in between. Um, and so we're trying to like now understand already the systems that we've created that we don't have language for. And I, um, this inference, like I, I can consent to my contacts being shared with Facebook and them understanding my social network. I can uh, consent to Facebook knowing where I am when I open the app via location services, but I don't necessarily get to consent to them understanding all of a sudden that I'm at my therapist and I have, you know, like other patterns on my, my usage allow them to infer that I have mental health problems, you know, or, you know, there's, there's, innumerable ways that we can consent to specific data points and we have no idea what is being inferred from them. And my question is actually something that Ingrid has written about and this is a very leading question because it hasn't been brought up in the panel yet and I would love for it to be discussed of um, the idea of liabilities or harms. And so machine learning can infer a lot of things and companies can treat them as neutral they can say like, oh, well, we're just exploring what the data says. Lots of people have touched on this. But we can actually write laws that say, it doesn't matter how neutral you think it is, it's the actual real world impacts that you're held liable to. And so it doesn't matter what you're saying, we're exploring or we're just asking or we want to see where the data takes us. What you actually have to worry about is what your legal liabilities are. So if this harms people in the real world, you get to be held liable to that, and that should be the starting point. The starting point is the negative consequences, not the positive consequences, I guess. And Inger's written about this in regards to literal genocide, and so I'm curious if that could be explored a little bit in this panel. We do it. Um, oh, cool. Uh, it's always good to know people read anything. I, re I don't even think my mom reads my stuff, so that's nice. Um, okay, I'm trying to think about like how to do this without just sort of recapping something that I've already like written and said. Um, the, I mean, I think I've been interested in liability as kind of a shift from accountability um, as like a thing to demand, partly because it seems let, like it has the potential, I think, um, to actually use something that genuinely like gets companies to like act, which is like the possibility they might lose money. Um, you know, I was thinking today about a, a thing that um, my friend Eleanor Saito once said to me really offhanded. She was like, corporations are like a form of artificial intelligence that we don't really like acknowledge. And so it's like sometimes it's like having to learn how to think like that machine and it's like, okay, Right now, like say, like bad press, it's like, okay, like Facebook, like they, they're sorry you feel that way. Uh, but like the second that they lose money, they're like, oh shit, we better do something. So like liability, if you, you can bring like a meaningful class action lawsuit, that could be like really interesting. Um, the challenge is like, you know, if one like the traditional trope of like law is slow, computers are fast, shruggy emoticon. <laughs> um, the second maybe is that like, just the amount, like law is also expensive, like the amount of money and the amount of lawyers that Facebook can throw at a problem is like staggering. Um, third is also just like the, and like the way, the, you know, the best like that you can get in most instances in terms of like enforcement is kind of like drop in the bucket settlements. I think like one of the bigger class action lawsuits that Facebook had, like everyone in the class got $15, like, it's like, great, cool. Um, so some, so I think like, I think there's a lot of possibility in like liability versus just sort of like this abstract idea of like accountable, transparent, whatever, because it actually threatens them. Um, but I don't know, I think there's a lot of like other organizing work to be done to actually effectively weaponize the law given how much, how many resources are already on like the corporate side. Yeah, to that I would just add, there's a concrete example of this. Um, it's against the law to discriminate in housing. You can't put an ad on Craigslist that says uh, white people only apply. That is against federal law. So Facebook got caught a number of years ago allowing people to sell ads, housing ads, uh, only to white people. 
And they said, oops, sorry, when they got caught. We won't do that again. Um, it's against federal law, my bad. And then what happened? Well, they did it again. They got caught again. So, you know, some, some people I think in this community have started talking about what it would actually take for a regulatory agency to be able to truly regulate companies like Facebook and Google that, you know, I mean, the level of complexity is so immense. These algorithms are changing constantly, right? I mean, tons of people have their hands in them, both on the, you know, corporate side and then the people who are actually coding them. So there really needs to be a sort of like consumer financial protection bureau type of regulatory agency at the federal level that has the power and the technical capacity to enforce even the most basic anti-discrimination law like the federal housing law that we've had for many years. So that's just one very concrete example of how difficult it is to solve that problem. It's almost as though you're thinking about a, a commission, a federal commission for like trade or something. <laughs> Wild. Um, and for what it's worth with that, with that particular example, um, the Facebook housing ads, like they're I think there are actually now two class actions against Facebook related to that story. So like, I don't know, hashtag impact. Right. Republican. But we can't just rely on Julia Angwin like to do this. Right. Like Julia Angwin is not a regulatory agency. So we should probably get a lot more Julia Angwins and pay them by the federal government and have those people enforcing the law. But I, nobody has said this yet. So I'm just going to say antitrust too. Hi. Um, someone briefly mentioned New York's algorithmic account accountability bill, um, as, and I think it, in some ways the way it's been implemented with a lot of uh, police unions um, lobbying the board that's going to be appointed kind of cuts against the idea that fairness, transparency aren't like the end goals. It's maybe some of these things shouldn't be plugged into algorithms in the first place. So I was wondering if some of y'all could talk a little bit about this bill in particular, what you think about it. Especially also like bearing in mind its origins, I think, was a, a city council person who was upset because they didn't know why they couldn't get more cops in their neighborhood and wanted to like be able to look into the algorithm and get more cops in their neighborhood. Thank you. Yeah, um, this, is, this is a really complex uh, situation. The first is that the board hasn't been appointed yet, so um, we don't know yet how that is going to look and what sorts of lot it's going to be brought to bear on them. Um, and certainly, I think the history and the context of where this is happening, I'm going to swap out because this is a weirdo mic, um, is, is enough to give us some double mic, um, some, some real cause for concern. However, having said that, um, there's no such thing as perfect law. What there is, is a set of uh, protocols and possibilities and languages that will emerge around how these things can be made enforceable. Now, we're not there yet, and certainly that bill is very, very open-ended. It's about creating a task force. I mean, it, it's, it's so small and minor that even at this point, it, it doesn't even have a framework, let alone a set of people, let alone a set of you know, enforceable mechanisms. But the fact that there is nothing of its ilk anywhere else in the entire country indicates to me that it's actually one of those moments that we should be caring a lot more about and actually watching and wanting to have a voice in and participating in it, because that's the way this stuff is going to happen. Law is an incredibly imperfect mechanism, um, but it is one of the mechanisms that we have. And it's interesting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm with Ingrid. I mean, I think we've got some really important tools that we don't use enough of. Um, but at the same time, you're talking about a corporate sector that's really, really good at doing a type of uh, um, shell game around how cases are brought against them. And you could look at exactly what happened in the sort of automobile industry in terms of liability, where you essentially play a type of regulatory arbitrage where you could be like, well, we could be sued for this much money, so we'll spend exactly this much on sort of safety precautions for this vehicle and know that a certain amount of people are going to be stuck in a burning vehicle. Um, and that's, that's a problem when we start to get right back down to what we were talking about earlier in terms of this idea of sort of the, the statistical probability that a thing will work for the majority of the people most of the time. Um, that's a much bigger problem. So I think the fact that we're starting to see seeds of discussion, even though they nascent, even though they're imperfect, are things that are opportunities for you to say, all right, how do we actually start to shape that better? And that's something that I think rather than just eye roll, oh my gosh, another failed bill, that we could start to say, actually, no, this is, this is a time for a much, much more granular local political conversation. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that is that um, politically, people 
who work in politics don't like to be the first often to do something. So there's a lot of utility just in the fact that something happened. Um, sure, it's not as strong as we would like it to be, but I will be able to m more powerfully uh, advocate for a stronger algorithmic transparency and justice um, ordinance at the Boston City Council because you will not, don't worry, city councilors, be the first person, people in the country to try something like this. And that's simple but true. So, um, piggybacking on, on something that Damien asked, um, a lot of what you're saying about the predictive algorithms and the uh, ability for uh, AI to track certain biometric data sounds like um, scientific racism writ large via AI, which goes back to John's point about the culture of Silicon Valley trying to use engineering solutions to fix social problems. So my question is generally, how do you get out of the uh, scientific racism uh, and to be clear, sexism, ableism, um, and all kinds of institutionalized oppressions writ large via tech if the, the software is actually doubling down on this? Because I can imagine a massive uh, problem if say we were to run mugshots through a predictive policing algorithm to try to determine the exact biometric data for specific kinds of criminals given the large numbers of people of color in jail. Um, as just a really quick response to that, that's a really good question because for me, I'm constantly thinking about all of the engineering responses to anything. I mean, with every racist algorithm, with every sexist algorithm, there's the we'll do better, um, more data, whatever, or it's the kind of sense that they blame it on the training data. There's a bunch of people like algorithms are racist, it's the data. And for me, that's like, it's obvious, right? But it, it gets to the larger point, which is that the, the training data comes from structure and you can never ever get perfect training data, ever. And if you've ever run a machine learning model, you realize that you know there's always, a lot of times machine learning is seen to be like this magical thing, like, oh, and here it arrives. Statistics. No, it's, yeah, statistics. But no, it's, it's, it's painstaking figuring out you know, different weights and eventually you pop out something that might be useful. But in terms of how it reifies things, and maybe this is being a naysayer, I think with that kind of modeling, the scientific racism is 100% always gonna be there if you're gonna to try to assess race, which goes back to case point. Like, why do we need to know if somebody's gay or racialized or gendered? I mean, it's for marketing, but then it has all these other ways to get through it. But for me, the idea would be to say, what if we just said, we don't want this? Or what if we would try to find ways to, to legislate against it? I think that the, the Facebook case for me is really interesting because they actually tried to get around it by saying that you're not ethnically X, you have an ethnic affinity of X. And it's that nice semantic change that allowed them at least public, yeah. And it's like, it's so dumb. But nonetheless, it is a structural way that they avoid those questions. And I really think that the question is one of the things we should sit with because it's not an easy solution because it's trying to draw from a white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchy world, period. Right, and the regulatory question becomes even more complicated because you're not allowed to do certain things on the basis of race in the United States, right? But there are proxies, so you can have an ethnic affinity. I'm not judging someone based on their race. I just see that you know this person really likes Kendrick Lamar and Black Panther and lives in you know uh, Brownsville. Like, I didn't ask about their race at all, right? Um, and that we're seeing that in the risk assessment instrument case when race is not a factor, but the number of prior arrests is, right? So. Certainly in the United States of America, that's racialized. Um, it makes enforcement very difficult. You know, I think that ultimately the answer is to fight back and not allow these systems to be used in the courts and in, in the policing context. And I think you've touched on the thing that actually keeps me up at night, which is that we are at a historical moment where two things are happening simultaneously. One is that we're actually starting to see a rerun of the ideas of phrenology brought straight back into AI. And you've seen this since everything from the, you know, the Wu and Zhang paper called Automated Criminality Inference Detection, which is like, oh, we can tell from your face if you're a criminal or not. Um, when did that happen? Oh, yes, Sir Francis Galton might have been trying that, you know, 100 years earlier. Um, that is happening at exactly the same time as we're starting to see the rise of race realism um, and this idea that, well, you know, maybe white people just are smarter than black people. Um, and what is 
even more concerning is to see the rise of those beliefs within Silicon Valley culture itself. So the call is coming from inside the house. You know, that is the problem, that actually the people building these tools may be believing exactly these types of, I think, really terrifying, sort of fundamentally racist things. So that's the situation that we have at the moment. We certainly saw this around sort of, you know, the, the anti-diversity memo inside Google, which, which was not an aberration. There were a lot of people who really supported that memo and continue to think that, you know, actually maybe women shouldn't really be doing computer science. Their brains are a different shape. You know, that's kind of really, they just shouldn't, exactly, they shouldn't be there. Um, and, you know, this is a really terrifying moment when we're starting to see the application of these tools to try and extract the truth of someone's identity from the way that they appear. So, so we are completely out of time. So, I will, so you want to take that energy and turn it into your TTW 19 uh, uh, abstract and lots of other uh, ways to, to keep things together uh, throughout the year. Did you want to have anything you wanted to say? No, just a round of applause for our brilliant panelists. Thank you. Thank you.